We're taught that British colonialism ended many decades ago, but there's one country in the world where Britain's relationship is so deeply embedded with its ruling family, a secret organisation called the Sultan's Privy Council, which takes place in Oman. The most senior people from the British establishment, heads of intelligence, of the military, of banking, of oil, of politics, are secretly flown out in a Gulfstream jet to the palace in Muscat, where they sit down with the Sultan and advise him for hours about how to run his economy, his defences, his foreign policy. Effectively, Britain is still running this country. To get invited to the Sultan's Privy Council, you have to be from parts of some of the most powerful bits of the British state. The head of MI6, the head of the UK military, one of the Queen's closest advisers, the former head of the Bank of England. There's about half a dozen members of the House of Lords. They've all been out to Oman. There are very strict rules in the House of Lords about having to declare both financial and non-financial interests. So the fact that they sit every year on this privy council in a foreign state, that they receive hospitality, free flights, free meals, free alcohol, these are the sort of things that should be declared on the House of Lords website. But when you look at their entries, there's no sign that they've entered this on the record. One of the key players on the Sultan's Privy Council is Alan Duncan, who was a Foreign Office Minister in the UK government. David Cameron made him a special envoy to Oman, which was a brand new position and he was secretly sitting on this Privy Council for at least 14 years. I first went when I was a young oil trader in 1986 and I've been going ever since. Other members of the Privy Council also have links to oil companies and arms companies. Sir Christopher Geit, who was a former army intelligence officer and diplomat and the Queen's private secretary for many years, he now sits on the board of BA Systems, the arms company. We know that he's also gone out to Oman to sit on the Privy Council and he's now in the House of Lords. But if you go on his House of Lords declaration of interests, there's no sign there that he is part of the Oman Privy Council. General Sir Nick Carter, who's the current chief of the defence staff, he's Britain's most senior military officer. Another key player is Sir Eric Bennett, who's an incredibly secretive former Air Vice Marshal in the Royal Air Force and he's been an advisor to Sultan Qaboos of Oman since the 1990s and the Privy Council from what we can tell seems to have been his idea so he's been inviting out all these people getting them to advise the Sultan on how to run his country and this is a country where the ordinary people have no say at all in how they're governed so political parties are banned independent media is shut down and if you insult the Sultan you can get put in prison for seven years and I know people who've been sent to prison in Oman for insulting the Sultan when they've got out of prison, they've claimed asylum in the UK and British immigration judges have said they're at real risk of persecution in Oman. The UN says that there's a pervasive culture of silence and fear in Oman, but this country is actually one of our closest allies. So even though it's not a democracy, we have over 90 troops on loan to the Sultan. That's the highest number of British troops on loan to any country in the world. That team is led by a two-star general. There's someone working there in the Directorate of Military Intelligence. Oman has one of the highest defence budgets per person. And this is a country that has a neutral foreign policy. So it's not at risk of being invaded by other countries. The reason why it spends so much on its military is to keep the people down. We saw this in 2011 in the Arab Spring. There were weeks of protests and demonstrations and in one city alone, 800 people were arrested. Britain is fully involved in keeping the Sultan in power. Since the young Sultan took over, he has doubled the size of the army and increased the number of his British advisers. All his closest aides are British, most of them former officers in the British army. The relationship between Britain and Oman goes back about 200 years. It was a key staging post on the way to India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. And then with the discovery of oil in the Gulf and in Oman itself, the country took on extra importance for the UK. British soldiers are helping the Sultan of Oman in his fight against communist rebels. To the extent that there was an area of land called Masandam, and this was a kind of autonomous region until 1970 when the SAS went in there and took over the area from the local people. And it was called Operation Intradon. And that's probably the most strategic part of the country because it has about a 20 mile stretch of water between it and Iran. And through that stretch of water, around a third of the world's oil supplies are shipped each day. British arms companies have benefited hugely from this relationship. Oman has spent billions of pounds on Typhoon fighter jets from the UK and millions of pounds on surveillance gear as well. GCHQ, Britain's largest intelligence agency, has three sites in Oman, listening stations. The Royal Navy has a new base there where the aircraft carrier is going to drop off on its way to China. 
and there's also a tank firing ground as well that's been set up there. So the Salt of Oman has huge support from British intelligence agencies, the military, and also from mercenaries and private security companies. This has all come out because Alan Duncan has published this diary about his years as a Foreign Office Minister. And in the diary, he spills the beans about these Privy Council meetings, which are things that we've never been able to get access to through freedom of information requests or public records. If it wasn't for him, it probably would have remained secret. Even though it looks like Alan Duncan has broken numerous transparency rules, there are no consequences for him now that he's stepped down as a minister and as an MP. But what's really interesting for me is Alan Duncan's diary was given exclusively to the Daily Mail and they had the first rights to serialise it and they had stories on their front page for days and days about the gossip that he was revealing in his diary and that was what the newspapers focused on. But on the same pages that Duncan was saying this in his diary, he was also saying, oh, I've just been out to Oman, I've been with the head of MI6 at the Privy Council meeting with Sultan Qaboos. And none of this has been covered in the other newspapers. I think many journalists who come across this story of Oman, rather than exposing this neo-colonial relationship, they're actually quite taken in by the idea that Britain continues to have this control over a country in the Middle East where around a third of the world's oil supplies are shipped through each day. And they put those interests above the fact that this is a dictatorship where fellow journalists, if they're Omani, are arrested, their newspapers are shut down, they're put in prison for insulting the Sultan. This shows actually that when it comes to it, you know, the British media talk a lot about concerns for democracy in countries like Iran, but here's a country where Britain has a huge amount of control over. There's absolutely no democracy or free speech whatsoever. And this has been going on for decades. When Caboose died in January last year, after 50 years in power, the BBC said that tributes were pouring in for Caboose as Oman mourned. Boris Johnson had said that Caboose was exceptionally wise and that he was deeply saddened by his death. And he flew out there almost immediately, along with Alan Duncan, Prince Charles, General Sir Nick Carter and the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace. They spent over £350,000 on flights for an overnight visit just for a photo opportunity with the new Sultan. Meanwhile, Omani exiles in the UK were receiving death threats and being warned not to criticise the new regime. Flags at British government buildings were lowered to half-mast as a sign of respect. So I think that moment really showed the true nature of British foreign policy. We're happy to prop up some of the biggest dictators in that part of the world when they do our bidding and it suits our interests. And that's what Boris Johnson means when Caboose was exceptionally wise, because he basically did what Whitehall wanted him to do, and often against the wishes of his own people. His Majesty is a nation builder. If you need a definition of puppet ruler, just look at Sultan Caboose of Oman and his successor, Haytham. This is neo-colonialism uh, par excellence. This shows that colonialism never ended. For 50 years, they kept Sultan Qaboos in power. How long are they going to keep Haytham in power as well? How long is this neo-colonialism going to continue for? The Ministry of Defence is very proud of its 200-year relationship with Oman. Is it going to last another 100 years, 200 years? The Conservative Party manifesto in 2019 said that Britain's alliances with like-minded democracies was a reason for us to hold our heads up high. And yet here we have this incredibly intimate relationship with one of the most secretive and repressive regimes in the Middle East. And yet some of the most powerful people in our country are telling him how to run his affairs and run his dictatorship. The kind of secrecy about what the head of MI6 is doing and the head of the British Army is doing in Oman, if they can get away with it there, you know, what's to stop them doing it in another country? In fact, what's to stop them doing it here? You're not going to hear these stories on the BBC or in The Guardian or The Times. It's only going to be independent media that brings you these stories. If you like this story and you're able to support independent media, please subscribe to Double Down News and Declassified on Patreon. Join the future of journalism, join Double Down News on Patreon.